Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Heron School of Art and Design for tonight's inaugural uh, event uh, of the LGBTQIA plus student forum with our special guest, Anthony Sonnenberg. Um, I would like uh, I would like first to acknowledge uh, that we are meeting on the traditional ancestral territory of the Miami, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people. As an institution, we are not only we not only stand on the historic homelands of native peoples, but also that of displaced black communities. As the present stewards of the land, we honor them as we live, work, study, and engage at IU, IUPUI. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, important partners. Uh, before I introduce Anthony, I would like to thank following sponsors for making uh, his time with us possible. As a groundbreaking for newly founded LGBTQIA plus student forum, tonight's talk has been centrally supported by the Indiana University Queer Philanthropy Circle with generous donations of Brightfield Giving. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank the Great Frame Up, a locally owned and premier destination for framing, for underwriting parking for our guests this evening. As a quick reminder, for those of you that are parked at the sports complex and the river, Riverwalk gar garages, which is just outside there, please remember to pick up a parking code at the main gallery. Just, just walk outside, uh, you will see it. Um, and lastly, thank you uh, to Hotel Indy for generously providing lodging to our visiting artists and guest speakers. We, uh, we appreciate uh, the generosity of our, all our sponsors in making, uh, making it tonight possible. Um, let me introduce Tony now. Uh, Tony is a multimedia artist uh, with his primary medium in ceramics, um, but also jewelry, uh, installation, drawing, textile work, and many others. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, he's represented by Conduit Gallery in Dallas, Texas, and works with Mindy Solomon Gallery in Florida and Gavlik Gallery in Los Angeles, where he is preparing for his first solo show in, uh, on the West Coast, uh, which opens in May. Currently, his work is also in uh, International Fair in Paris. Uh, Tony, a Texas native, completed his Bachelor of Studio Art, uh, Italian and Art History at the University of Texas in Austin in 2009, before pursuing his MFA in Sculpture from University in Washington, uh, of Washington in Seattle, where he finished in 2012. As an educator, Tony uh, has taught ceramics at Glassell School of Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, Houston, as well as the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and Oxbow School of Art. Uh, his residences include Yaddo, Archie Bray, ceramic residency at University of California in Long Beach, and many others. Um, some of the notable exhibitions that um, uh, Tony's work has been included are Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas, Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, Texas, the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts, Craft Contemporary in Los Angeles, and Seattle, Seattle Art Museum in Washington. Um, we are honored to have Tony as our guest speaker. Um, and please uh, join me to welcome Anthony Sonnenberg. Alright, let me get settled in here. Whew. Thanks for having me, Indiana. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to big, uh, say a big thank you to Robert for bringing me in and working with me so closely, and Paula for um, 
including my work in the, the show in one of your many awesome galleries that I got to see today. Um, and thank you to Heron School of Art for having me. Uh, it's our, my first time and my partner's first time to Indianapolis, and we've enjoyed it. You guys have a lot of good monuments and tombstones. <laughs> we went to your graveyard cemetery, whatever you want to call it, and it's one of my favorites. Um, <clears throat> okay, so to get started, uh, this is my this is one of my little little pet babies uh, because I think written artist statements are kind of stupid. <laughs> I don't like them. <laughs> And I, I, I tried to teach a class uh, about how to how to write them, and the students were just like, wow, this, this is really hard, and it sucks. And I was like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so I was kind of thinking my way around it, and I was thinking about, like, memes uh, and how uh, they're scary effective at, like, communicating complicated ideas in really simple ways. And so I was trying to kind of bridge the information that you need to get from an artist talk into a more visual form and it's kind of also functions a little bit as like a roadmap perhaps for the work you're going to see because it's it's there's a lot of it and it, and it ranges kind of all over um so basically there's kind of like the four titles or the four main bubbles that i think most of the work comes out of are desire beauty time and death and at the kind of corners of those are um, different kind of tones that the work can take. So we have tragedy, we have romance, we have comedy, we have drama. Um, I'll switch between all of those different kind of tones in the work at all different times, depending on what I need at the time. Um, and a lot of really common subject matters are going to be uh, opulence, myth, and memory, and how those kind of affect us in our understanding of, of time and who we are. Um, still life and how still lives work uh, because they're actually, once you start getting into still lives, much more complicated than you would think. Um, and then there's always a lot of references to history and it can be societal history, so like over centuries or personal history, like my own life, or it could be geological things where we start talking about hundreds of millions of years um, and how all those kind of things can be talking about the same thing, which is time. Um, and then more specifically, you're going to see my body featured a lot. Um, I think, I mean, our, all of our bodies are important to all of us because <laughs> they are modes of living, but um, I think a lot about my body being a fat person, being a queer person, um, being a person who sees himself more on the femme side. Um, has really affected maybe more than anything the way that I see the world, move through the world, and, and, and see my place in the world. Um, and I think that's kind of backed up by our history to um, double check my experiences against the experiences of people from across time and to see what maybe belongs to me in my time and what are things that are more universal. and. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we think, oh my God, I have iPhone 14, we're so advanced. And then you go back and you look at our history and you're like, oh, well, we still are worried about dying. We still are worried that, I don't know, <laughs> we may be poor or we want to be rich or we want people to think that we're rich even if we're poor. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff has, has, has been around for almost as long as we've been around. Um, and I think checking back into those kind of things helps me um, have perspective and to see things in perspective, which is very important. And then perhaps most of all, you'll see flowers. Always flowers. I love, love, love flowers. Um, and I think they, they're as complicated as they are simple in so many ways. And then all those things together is my art. Yay! So um, I always, for many, many years, started my artist talks here. This is a very famous Baroque work by John Lorenzo Bernini. Um, it's called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And uh, it's famous because, uh, long story short, it looks like this nun uh, who is meant to be having a religious experience looks like she's having a sexual orgasm. And uh, people have uh, snickered about it for uh, 400 years now. <laughs> and, uh, and the joke never gets old. Uh, famously, a French cardinal once said about 100 years after the piece was actually made, he said, uh, if that's God's love, I know all about it. <laughs>
<laughs> um, but I, I start here because why do I start here now that I got up on that story? Oh my gosh, I've <laughs> knocked my own my own self off course. Um, I guess I, I start here because uh, I, I I found out who Bernini was and really started learning about him and kind of and. and uh, using lessons that I've learned from him in my work from a very early stage, like from kind of my first years in undergrad. Um, he taught me that art and power are very directly collect connected. Um, you do not need to always tell the truth to get your point across. Um, it is okay, and in fact, it may be necessary to use cheap tricks like fancy marble or hidden lighting or sex cells you know, to get people's attention. Um, I think the context of this work that maybe not everybody understands is so there is, this period of the Baroque was actually a brief period where the church was really, like the Catholic church was really in power. It had uh, money and it had kind of not had power before that. And it was soon to not have power after this. But for this moment, there was a lot of money and a lot of art going around and they were um, building new churches and renovating old churches. And what they were really doing was kind of making this case for the Catholicism in a new, like, Protestant threatened world. And their case that they made was the religious experience is so vast and so unimaginable and so intense to an orgasmic level that you need the church to help you handle it because all this Protestant stuff about you having a direct line, you're, you're going to OD and, and, and it's not going to work and you need the church to handle these crazy experiences. Um, and so I guess I just get really interested in that because it's both this direct expression of the church's power, trying to show the rest of the world that they are powerful, they are not under threat, and also communicating why, why you need them. And I get, and he's doing all that with the image of a nun who's looking like she's having an orgasm. And so I get very interested in how all that works. Um, interestingly enough, it's not saying about the truth, uh, she did have this experience. She did describe being pierced in the chest and it, and it sounded like an orgasm, but this woman looks about maybe 20 at the most, beautiful, smooth skin. At the time that the woman was having uh, these experiences, she was like 50, locked up in a nunnery in uh, Spain and looked nothing like what she looks here. Uh, this is one of the earliest pieces I'll show. Uh, it's called The Apotheosis. Uh, and I got really interested in this idea that, um, so in past societies like Rome, where uh, they are basically theocracy, so uh, government and religion are combined. Um, <clears throat> when a Roman emperor would die, or basically any person uh, who, who goes through this, pharaohs go through the same thing, uh, you would go through a process called the apotheosis, which was um, the process of becoming a god from a mortal through death. Uh, Magdalene Mary goes through, you know, the Virgin Mary goes through a very similar thing. Uh, and I think very early on, I was interested in um, things that had duality, things that were in gray areas, things that um, existed in a, in a realm of fantasy and seem unlikely to me today, but come with the knowledge that at a certain time they were fact. This was part of state fact. <laughs> when uh, Augustus Caesar died, he became a god in their eyes. And, um, and a lot of Christians got burned to the stake because they didn't agree with that. So it was very important. Uh, and I, uh, this is one of the first pieces I made when I went to grad school, and I'm still pretty proud of it. Uh, and you're also going to see a lot of mixing of media going on here. So there's ceramics and fabric and this found bobcat. Uh, at this time, I was really interested in taxidermy because it it seemed also like it was in this weird peripheral state. It was a thing that was dead, and it's, and it's not even the whole thing. It's just the skin, but it's playing to be alive. And, and what actually is it? Is it a trophy? Is it a, 
you know, <laughs> where does it exist? And when you started kind of asking questions about it. And it also seemed to be a very masculine thing to me. I grew up in Texas, in very rural Texas, and so like the football team would go hunt varmints or hunt with their fathers or whatever. And my bonding with my father was all about the garden. So um, it seemed kind of weird. <laughs> I was trying to get to understand it better. Um, and then this, I think, is another important thing to kind of understand is I really, really, really love Antiques Roadshow. Uh, <laughs> I have watched the British, I watched the American, uh, I've, tr I've watched snippets on YouTube of the Canadian and the Australian, so if I can, you know, and if somebody knows how to get me, like, that Australian line, I love it. <laughs> but, um, I've watched it for many years. It's like my going to sleep show or my calm down show. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> one of the reasons that I think I really like it is, is I, I have a hard time watching things that have awkwardness or tension in them because I find that there's already too much awkwardness and tension and kind of drama in the real life. So I try in my, in my fantasy world of TV to, to avoid those things. Uh, and anti is kind of, <laughs> kind of as far away from those things as you can get. But I asked myself a lot of questions about why I like it so much, and I think what I came back to is um, it, it, it's almost like the Bernini sculpture in that, in that on this show they're making connections between very romantic ethereal things like um, a baseball card uh, that was shot through by Billy the Kid um, could be worth fifty thousand dollars because because why uh, because it's romantic and it, it gives you some kind of mystical connection to Billy the Kid who you could never get close to because he's dead and gone but but the next best thing is you can hold you could own this card and you could own a piece of history and and that's all wishy-washy like <laughs> you can't weigh that you know that that's all myth and context and just kind of romantic people's feelings coming in there, but then through desire, or as they would say on the show, through demand, um, it can then equal $50,000, which is, which is hard cash. <laughs> you know, that's a physical thing that, I mean, it is a big lie, you know, and that's another story, but, but it is this thing that in our life we all understand, whether you like art or not, you know what $50,000 means. Um, and so I, I'm very interested in both kind of how they celebrate those stories and the kind of almost like horcrux quality that an object can have, like it can almost feel like it contains a piece of somebody's soul, you know, or some kind of connection to that, that kind of romantic idea about objects, and then say, okay, because enough people want it who have money, it's now equal to this. And then suddenly this thing that maybe didn't have importance to the person or they didn't like it or whatever is now transformed in their eyes, almost by magic. Um, okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna try and move quickly, but I'm also gonna take a big digression and do uh, a little mini kind of lecture about still eyes because I think they're so important um, to how my work uh, functions. Um, like I was talking about my body and my kind of how it affects my way through the world. Um, I'm overweight, I'm a diabetic, and I also love food and I love sugar, and I have a hard time with self-control in those areas. And, uh, and because I'm queer, um, I grew up being terrified of AIDS and thinking that if, if I was to have sex, it would always come at the risk of either getting a, you know, a disease or putting myself in possibly a life-threatening situation. And so from a really early age and kind of in a constant experience like pleasure or satiation of desire is always kind of shadowed or accompanied by the specter of death. Um, so my parents, not in a, I wouldn't say like in an abusive or any way, just out of their own concern, always talking about how I had to lose weight because I wouldn't get jobs, I wouldn't be desired, you know, I, all the all the problem i mean uh they just did a study about how measuring people's changing biases and they found that um biases against homosexuality have have gone down dramatically biases against race have gone down dramatically within the last 10 years but biases against fatness and the elderly and um i think femininity <laughs> uh had raised 
I remain pretty much the same. So um, I think a lot of the work to understand it, and I have to remind myself to like keep my own self on track, is, 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 is working through this relationship, this complicated relationship between these two things. Um, and I think still life does a really good job of being an example of this working in, in throughout art history because a still life, um, they've actually been around for thousands of years. They go, the Romans had still lives, Egyptians had still lives. Um, they're kind of maybe most well known, like this image on the right here, which is a Dutch still life. Uh, and then this one over here on my left is a photographic image by uh, an artist slash fashion photographer named David LaChapelle, um, who worked with um, a lot of queer imagery, bondage imagery, famously worked and, and was doing it in very high echelon. So he, I think he still works with Vogue, but he did a lot of crazy shoots with Vogue. Um, and he would feature Amanda Lepore, who was one of the very early trans icons. Um, and so uh, he's, he's very smart about culture and contemporary culture and um, how to sell it, how to create it, how to, how to make things that have desire. And um, I saw these images and he just did a series of them and I don't know how much he's worked in uh, still life since then, but I thought they, they really stick with me with the way that he both plays uh, with fantasy, with high and low. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. So how these things kind of <laughs> represent my work is, at least in the Dutch sensibility, they are um, on the surface seemingly, and for my eyes, advertisements for indulgence, for luxury, for these magnificent displays and as they go on in western art history they get more and more uh kind of decadent so in the 15th century they're rather kind of tame and then in the 16th century uh 1600s you get the skulls and the glass and the snail and all those kind of things and then in the 1700s you get these amazing kind of orgasms of flowers coming out um so on the surface they seem like they're these these advertisements, but in their conception, they were conceived as memento moris, or another way of saying everybody's reminders that everybody's going to die, and uh, that you should not become too attached or too infatuated with these um, not lasting pleasures, and you should instead, you know, look to Jesus uh, for everlasting saving things, but, um, at some point in time, they, they kind of go off the tracks. <laughs> I don't know how much they end up being that if, if only in tradition. And, and I don't know that they function that way in other, in other cultures like Rome, for, for instance. Um, but they, so they have this tension of, they seem to say one thing and then they're also doing another. And, 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 and for thousands of years, the flower has been this very potent, kind of analogy for the human body and, and how uh, not lasting it is. And I think that's something I really love about it. And it's also been this everlasting symbol for beauty. And so I think those are two things that I'm very, very interested in. But also as a gardener, uh, a still life for me is a reminder of life and death and that if you've ever tried to grow something, especially in somebody, it's something as unhospitable as North Texas, you would, I would just plant things and they would always die. Just in the middle of the summer, it gets so hot, and I'd be so attached, and then I'd know about June, I had to let it all go, um, and then find the resilience to plan again next year or not. Um, but they're also slightly very artificial in ways that you might not expect, and they tell you things that are not true. So um, this painting on the right is a painting by a guy named Jan Wien uh, Huisman, uh, and it is said that sometimes it took him several years to make one of these paintings because he had to paint every element from life. And none of these things are actually growing at the same time. So up here we have grapes and we have peaches. That's all late fall. Uh, we have these hollyhocks, which would be made summer. Um, this one actually is kind of staying not, not too bad in season, but a lot of these things will have all these flowers that don't, that don't exist at the same time. And, 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 if you were living in the 17th century and had maybe a little bit closer a relationship with the rhythm of nature, you would really be known about that. 
And then also there's all this interesting trampoline going on. So I, I could go on for forever about why I like them. But I thought, uh, I think why I pair it with the David LaChapelle um, image is because I think uh, I am looking at the framework from several hundred years ago, but I think David LaChapelle is making a, a is using a similar method of how to keep that fresh and bring it forward. And still, it's been interesting. They've been around they through modernism, Picasso and Van Gogh and uh, Cezanne, you know, all these modern people. Um, I show these two images together. Another thing that I like about flowers and why I think it comes back to me is because nobody really expects a lot from flowers. Um, they are, uh, they're, they're, in most people's eyes, they're not life deciding elements of flower, right? Um, but, uh, because they exist in this weird side thing for through all our history, still life has been the lowest uh, rated form and flowers even lower. But because they were so low, people who were not a, a accepted elsewhere to have the power to be a painter could excel here. So on the right, we have an image by one of, I think, the best floral still life painter of all time, Rachel Rausch, and this is from 1720. Um, and she, uh, she was the ultimate working mother badass. She painted and supported a family of 10 children, painted her whole life. Her paintings were worth famously more than Rembrandt's and she never went out of fashion. She painted and people wanted her work from the moment she started to the moment she died. And um, so I think uh, part of my work is also recasting these things that seem not important from the light of somebody who is on the margins like a queer fat man and say, actually, these things are harbors of safety <laughs> for, you know, um, because women for so long were not allowed the same creative outlet. And so they had so little outlet. So for so, for so many women throughout history, these things were safe harbors, were the one place where they could really, without um, criticism or challenges, express themselves. And in my mind, it has the same gravitas as this image here on the left, which is a very famous image by Caravaggio from 100 years ago, um, the deposition of Christ. Uh, obviously, they share the same kind of um, lighting and um, uh, symmetry. Um, and I think, to my eyes, had the same kind of pathos as importance. Um, I just wanted to show you, here's a still life from Rome, from Herculaneum. Um, notice this rabbit over here and this hanging partridge. So this is from um, 100 AD, something like that. And then uh, here we go with an image by Jean Chimian Chardin, who is a still life painter. At working at the same time as Rachel Rausch, making these very gray, dark, still images. Um, and what I and he's one of my favorite artists, and I think he he really reminds us because we'll go into the Rococo and talk about it more. But the Rococo is so famous for being light and airy and, and pursuit of happiness and frivolity, but it also has this whole other side of melancholy. And I don't know if you guys know who Chardin is, but uh, he, he's a very interesting artist. He's one of the few artists that, uh, that was a still life artist that made it into the Royal Academy in Paris. Normally they didn't even let them in because they didn't respect them enough to even be part of their club. But he was so undeniably good and interesting in doing his own thing that they let him in. And what do we have 2,000 years later, partridge and a hare. Um, part of the reasons why his images are so different is he actually had a lot of death in his life. He, he, his first wife died and the daughter they had also died and he got remarried and his daughter died from that marriage and his son, he had a son that committed suicide. Um, and so he had a lot of reasons to be melancholy and a lot of pain and a lot of pathos. And I think the way that he chooses to express it in these, these still lives where somebody once said that it looks like they pump the air out of this image. Um, Here's the other side of Rococo. This is another image that I'm very, very interested in. And I've never seen this place in person, but I dream about it all the time. I wonder if I'll ever see it in person because it may no longer live up <laughs> to like my dream of it. But there's something about the fantasy of this, the frivolity of this, the sheer, um, I guess from American Puritanism, I'm like, how is this allowed? How come nobody shamed these people for being too extravagant? Uh, 
and just the lightness and the silver and the reflection of it and the way that it seems to kind of melt. Um, I think that feeling of this is, is, is so much what I'm trying to go for in the studio and trying to get to in the studio. And so, um, so yeah, it's a real mix, but again, we come back to this idea of like, I love the Rococo because it's this and it's Chardin at the same time. And it's this time period where uh, it's the height of craft before the Industrial Revolution. It's one of the few time periods in world history where the feminine aesthetic, a woman, um, uh, L Madame Pompidou originates this Rococo style with her, uh, not husband, but he was his, she was his main courtesan. They invent this thing of Rococo and make it the royal style. Uh, and that happens very few times in history that women are, that their perspective and their aesthetic that's or what traditionally associated with them in Western culture is allowed to be the language of power. Uh, and then at the same time, this is when slavery explodes because of the colonies. This is the time of revolution. Um, and so it's always stuck in my mind as this crazy, I, I love it and I hate it and I want to support it. And I also know that I have to be careful about how and where, you know, and be smart about that because um, I might be endorsing things that I don't personally want to endorse. Um, so we're going to kind of move on to ceramics and um, these are also Rococo objects. They're also from the 17th century. Uh, famously, the French invented the Rococo, uh, more or less. Um, uh, but then it spreads out. It's one of the first truly, well, the Baroque is really the truly first international style, and then the Rococo is kind of on its curtail. So it starts in one country and goes across uh, Europe very quickly. Um, and funny enough, I, I think my most famous Rococo objects are not French. Uh, these two uh, on the left are actually English. Uh, one is from the Chelsea Porcelain Factory here in the middle, and the other one I think is from Rockingham Factory, and I, they have the best flowers out of all of them. And then this one here on the left is called Meissen, uh, and they were the ones that cracked the porcelain uh, secret in Europe. For the longest time, the Chinese were the only ones that knew how to make porcelain because they were the ones that had the actual raw ingredients to do it. And uh, they were <laughs> trying, you know, they were not going to let that secret go for anything because it was worth so much money to them. And famously, the prince who ran the, the Duchy of Saxony where Meissen was before Germany was a unified country, locked a man in a dungeon cell until he figured out how to make porcelain. Uh, and I don't know, I'm sure that's not 100% true, but I, I love the story. And again, it goes to show that things like porcelain, things like these that seem so freely and so crazy at the time were worth the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, say you have this in your house, it's a royal sponsored factory. Everyone knows that, especially in terms of like Seb, which is a very famous uh, French factory. Say you have a vase like this in your house and the French Revolution breaks out and the people come to your house and they want to know who do you support and they look on your mantle and they see Meissen Port or they see Seb Porcelain, you may not survive. This thing could, you know. So again, I think a lot of the work that I'm doing here too is really challenging the order and value of things and to show how under certain contexts they can become extremely important. Um, and even under other contexts, they can be really important, but just in ways that uh, are hard to uh, hard to know. And I think one way that I really experience in my real life is one of the things that they say, <laughs> my doctor's always telling me that's so dangerous about things like diabetes and these kinds of things, is that I don't know when I'm sick. I don't always feel it, but it's there, and it's affecting me all the same. Um, so these are two of my works. Uh, this piece here on the left uh, is an urn, uh, and it I made it at the Long Beach Residency, and it's now it's the only piece that I actually had collected into a museum, and so now it's in the Crystal Bridges collection. Uh, and this is a piece on the left that I just finished, and this this gold luster glaze is made with real gold, um, and so I had a collector who paid an extra thousand dollars just to get this specific gold, and it's kind of amazing because the reflective power of it. Um, is is so much increased than any other kind of surface, um, and I'm really I'm always kind of interested in this idea of maximalism of too much, uh, but also 
I, um, I've never forgotten the story that I heard in an art history class one time about uh, a professor who went to Alhambra, uh, Alhambra which is a very famous uh, Islamic palace in southern Spain, dating from the time when that was ruled by Islamic um, powers. And they have, they, they have very strict rules about what they can have on their decoration. They can't have images of people. Like a lot, of, some sects can't have images of even um, animals or plants. Uh, and so they rely a lot on geometry and things like that. Um, and they have these domes that are these really insanely crenellated and exacting kind of bits of, of geometry. And she thought that perhaps their function was to feel as if they were dematerializing in front of your eye and to kind of highlight the permeability between this world and the next and to kind of remind the worshipers that they are not as far away from these kind of exalted other worlds. Um, and I, I've always been really interested in that effect and, and always trying to recapture that. So you'll see on top of this very undulating surface, I'll put dots or stripes or whatever to even further break up the surface even more and make them even more um, kind of ethereal. Um, and you'll see, uh, oh yeah, I want to show you that. So this is a piece of Sev. And I want to show you, I saw this in LACMA, in, in, or, no, sorry, at the Getty Center in Los Angeles. And uh, do you see here in this picture how the surface on this, it seems like it's shimmering, like maybe it has like colored chips or something on it, and it's covering the whole vase. That is not a shimmer, that is a hand-painted dot pattern. And I, I have, I could, a hundred hours, a thousand hours, I, they do know that one person was famous for, I guess, having the patience and the temperament to do this. Um, but also, the front, they call it the egg vase, and they don't know what it was, just as a giant egg. <laughs> and, um, and man, this, that really got the French court going, let me tell you. Um, I'm really interested in kind of, uh, I think luxury and, and all these kind of things are very interesting to me. So uh, I've been making chandeliers for many years. This is one of the most recent ones. It's my first double <laughs> chandelier. Um, a lot of people ask me in my talks, they're like, how do you, why are you, why are you supporting luxury? Why are you making these things of luxury? You know, like, cause you, because you mentioned, you know, like ethically they have problems and, and all these kind of things. And I, I think uh, why I keep coming back to them is because I believe that luxury is an extremely effective tool of letting people know where power resides because wealth also resides there. And because having wealth is the easiest way to make images or structures of luxury, we think that it belongs to the rich, but it does not belong to them. If you're smart and you think about things like taste and um, decorum and all these kind of things that queer people have used for years to gain power, uh, you, you can have just as much ownership over luxury and create luxury uh, through your own just manpower and kind of creativity if you want. Um, and uh, money just makes it easier. And you don't have to be smart if you have money, right? That's the beautiful thing about it. You can be as dumb as a brick and, <laughs> and say, you, smart queer person, make this. And then I will, <laughs> the smart queer person will come. <laughs> but I will take those lessons and I will apply them to make myself feel luxurious and also try and garner power to the queer image overall because uh, uh, creativity um, really collapses a lot of social structures in a way that, that I'm fascinated by. Um, so this is another thing. Uh, like I said, time is very important. Sometimes I get um, stone and I think about eternity a lot and it goes crazy inside and I think eternity is a very interesting visual challenge because what is it you know what is it how do you how do you visually represent forever I can't the thing about it is is I can talk about eternity but I'll never fully understand what that means I think it's physically mentally impossible to understand something going on forever um, but I, I really kind of uh, enjoyed this I've made several clocks that have no hands um, because I think for me a broken clock is this idea of eternity in a weird way, and then you can kind of see here on the surface the sparkling, mesmerizing texture that then is about this idea of kind of, to understand eternity, you kind of have to go beyond your, like, your everyday understanding because we, we just, 
it, we don't we don't experience it <laughs> in reality. It's just still this kind of interesting conceptual thing that. Um, but I, I had an interesting phrase the other day, and I, I think this, the way I would say these works is, I am exploring my relationship with eternity. Isn't that, isn't that great? So it's going into that, uh, I get really interested in, 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 in cemeteries um, because I think they're actually very beautiful. And uh, you ask yourself, uh, this style of cemetery with these giant obelisks and uh, mausoleums and all these things that would have cost hundreds of thousands, I mean, that has got to cost in today's money a million dollars. I don't know what would. Why are they spending this money? Uh, back in the day before they had Central Park and they had all these designated public spaces that were for people's recreation, people would go to graveyards and they would picnic there and they were considered public sculpture gardens and so I think it was it, you you could trust that when these monuments were being made people would see them and be judging them and, 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 and understanding your family's wealth through them and so they were worth this whole expenditure um, so me getting interested in cemeteries was cornered with me coming to terms with ceramics and being a ceramic sculpture and functionality and I used to say, uh, I don't care about functionality, and the work kind of started brushing up in functionality, and I also started learning more about ceramic history and began to understand that like ceramics is here because it does certain functional things like hold water, um, stand up to high temperatures, uh, and that's why basically every civilization in the world throughout time that has access to clay has used clay because it does these things so well. And I thought, well, maybe I don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe I can just look for more interesting ways for functions to show itself. And so I really started getting interested in, into tombstones because for me, they were these beautiful aesthetic just decorations, giant, permanent. Most part, they're not figurative. They do not have people in them, and they still represent people. And I was researching about them, and somebody said in the book, the function of a tombstone is simply to say, I existed which I thought was really kind of crazy and so simple, like it hits you in the face. And, and that's what they are, it's just to say, it's just, it's just people grappling with the fact that like, uh, if I have to die, please don't let me be forgotten. Um, there's a book written whose title is Escaping Me that talked about all the different ways that you could think about immortality and how it might exist. And there were all these different options. You could uh, put your mind in a computer. You could go about it in kind of a, a mythical way and become a vampire. Uh, you could say, well, my body may die, but my soul will go on. And so that's where name your religion, you know, that kind of going through there. Um, but another thing you could say is, well, my body might die and I may not believe with a soul, but I might possibly exist if my memory goes on. Um, and so I just got really interested in that idea. And I, I, I thought, I'm still playing around with this idea that, you know, as it, several years ago when we were going through this really kind of reckoning with what a public monument should do, what it should be, what a public monument should not be. Uh, and I don't know if we ever really got to the bottom of that conversation, but um, something that I was really kind of thinking that was so interesting about tombstones is because they're um, drawn, they're from this time period where they're just drawing from everything. There's Egyptian tombs, and they're all, they're in this very interesting period from after the Civil War to about 1920. Uh, and so part of it, part of their function is uh, America figuring out how to handle the mass death of the Civil War. So many people lost people in so many crazy ways. They did not know how to do, how to handle their grief. And so making these complicated tombstones and, and putting all this time and energy was a way of them kind of handling their grief. It was also a way, you know, to, to show uh, family wealth. But also um, they were in a time where they were, they, they didn't have like, um, loyalty to any specific like scheme. You could put Egyptian with Art Nouveau, with this, with that, mix it all together. It doesn't matter if it looks good to you now, let's do it, let's put it in stone. And so for me, it was like this incredible bank of knowledge that I could draw from. Um, and so I got really interested in those kind of tombstones. But I, what I thought about them is because they're these just essentially abstract 
decorations drawn from history that they have a flexibility to them in time that I think sometimes monuments get too specific and, and maybe what they're really supposed to do is just to form places where people can come and be a marker in the city and help you know where you are and help you also track your own time through the city, through these relationships, through these markers that don't change. Uh, I don't know. So I've been, I, I, I don't have an answer to this, but it, it's, it's, a, it's something that I keep thinking about and rolling around in my eye because it's such a... Has anybody ever had a class in art school about how to make a good monument and what it should be? And yet, I think we do need them. Uh, anyways, I'm moving on. Uh, tombstones, looking really a lot of tombstones. This is one of my first tombstones. Uh, thinking about function. Um, this one on the right is the most recent one. I'm going to show this in my show in LA. Uh, it, I, I'm, I get really nerdy about things having dual functions, so I thought this would be really cool. Uh, I have this funny idea, what I think was funny, was like, wouldn't it be crazy if there was a tombstone that also had a pipe in it? Because <laughs> I, I think these graveyards don't have a function for most people. They're just around and like, why should we care about them? And I remember being in high school and being queer and smoking weed and kind of being, for all those reasons, in this other group and just wanting a place to go where like cops and parents and fucking conservative Texas hicks weren't hassling me. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if I could hide out, if I knew there was a tombstone in the graveyard that I could go smoke and chill out and be left alone? And so, I don't know, I just really fell in love with that idea of, of, of some, again, of a, of, a, of a monument having multiple purposes and doing things besides, I don't know, marking time. Also making life possible in weird ways. Uh, another thing that I really got interested in was the idea of urns. Like, um, so many people want to get cremated these days and what do you do with the ashes? You put them in an ugly urn and that's supposed to be in your house the whole time. I'm not interested in it. I want to make something really beautiful and crazy and, and make, uh, you know, more niche kind of things and make, I don't know. I don't know, just play around with that idea and push it around and see where it could go. And so this is a, what I call the pet and parent urn. So you have this woman with her dogs and you can't really see in it, but inside it there's two compartments. Uh, one is slightly bigger than the other. And so one compartment is for you and the other compartment is for your dog because, uh, you know, don't you want to be with your dog forever? I do. Um, or you could switch it. So if you had like 10 dogs, you could put all the 10 dogs in the big thing and you could put yourself in the smaller thing. Um, I think what I've been really doing a lot more lately, and I think there's so many elements to the practice and we haven't even gotten to the bottom of it yet, but I've been trying to think you know, so, so much about it. It's like, what, what's the through line? How can I talk about this in an elevator pitch? How can I get it all under one roof? And what I really started thinking about is I'm interested in decoration overall and, when you, and, and blowing out the idea of what decoration could be. I haven't gotten down to what decoration is. Every time I think I get to it, it flies away and scurries away and somebody goes, what about this and what about that? So again, it's one of those things that's very complicated. But um, like I said, I think so much that decoration, like fashion, like so many things tells a story. It's there to communicate either who you are and also who you want the world to see you to be. And it lets you know um, what a certain thing is valued in that society. So even though I'm not a religious person, I really like looking at churches because I think the challenge of what decoration should heaven have? If I am a Christian person and I'm putting myself in that shoes, and most of these artists were, for the most part, and through my studies, very devout religious people. If heaven is something so good we can't even understand it, how do you make that, how do you make that visible? Uh, and you do it through decoration, and you think, what do we have, what is the most valuable thing to us? Jewels, gold. You know, time, time is valuable. So let's make everything look like it took forever to make and probably did take forever to make. And so we can see it here in a religious context about um, decoration being essential to trying to communicate unreal ideas into reality. And I get really fascinated with that. Um, it can also tell you things that are not true. So this is an image of a palace, an unfinished palace of, uh, of this weird Bavarian king called Ludwig II. 
Um, he's the one that made the fairy tale castle that Disney is based on, and, and so many castles in 20th century are all based on this fairy tale castle. And by the way, that castle was made to look like a fairy tale. He was obsessed with Wagner. Um, he was a person, uh, his father actually had power, but he comes right before the unification of Germany becomes one country. And so he's in this little thing where he, he, he is, the Bavaria is now part of Germany. Germany has a main ruler, the Kaiser. He is a this traditional figure. He's still in power in his thing, but he doesn't actually have any, any actual power, but he does have a stipend and he is, um, we think an agoraphobe in that he had diagnosable mental illness and he makes these crazy castles that are meant to show everyone how rich he is and the power that he still has. But guess what? Guess how many people came into these palaces? Almost none. They were for him alone. And in fact, I think it's in this palace, uh, he uh, wanted to be, not see anybody so much that he made a room that had a, t that had a floor that would descend down and then come back up so that the servants would set his table, put the food on the table, the table would come up and he'd never actually have to see them. Um, and what I like about this image is, is, is I see what he's trying to do, but it's a little bit too much. The proportion is not quite there. The chandelier is a little bit too big. It doesn't make sense when you really kind of, Jessica Fletcher, you know, murder she wrote the clues, like the, something doesn't add up, right? Uh, and, and it's that the guy is, 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 is not the real deal. He doesn't have power and he doesn't have control over himself or uh, his kingdom. Uh, and then I love to go from that image to this image. Does anybody know where this is? Trump's a famous New York apartment uh, where he, again, is trying to, trying to tell you he's the top of class, okay? This is, in his mind, what, what the ultimate should be, and it's gold, and it's crenellation, and it's all these things that you see in all these palaces, but I just don't quite buy it. I don't think the taste level is quite there, and so, I don't know. Let's, let's just say, I add it to my list of questions about the former president. <laughs> um, thinking a lot about that work, uh, this is a piece that I made uh, about almost a year ago exactly. Uh, and um, this is kind of me really working with, um, so I, I said to myself, if I'm gonna work with decoration, I wanna work from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. So I started bringing in jewelry into the practice and I started really further developing these big room size installations. Um, and the purpose of this was to kind of, this is a mix of, of high and low, some of its art that I've made, some of its real deal antiques that I've collected, but most of it is gold plastic and dollar store material that I bought. I, I just, I, it's great because I go, they go, we want you to make this installation. And I go, I'm going to need $2,000 to buy things from the party store. And they go, okay. And I just like buy boxes and boxes and boxes of it. And then just kind of, play it and arrange it and make it all work together so that in my mind, it's not permanent, it won't last forever, it won't last, who knows how long it would last, but for a moment and through my own power and what I can convince a university to give me sometimes or museum, um, I make these what I think are pretty convincing images. And I wanted to make them so that people could have the choice about whether they wanted that image to apply to them or not. So if you look here in this, in this, this central thing, you see this white circle, here. So you could actually come through around and put your face in this circle and become like the focal point of this whole, I don't know, Gilded Age <laughs> set piece. Um, and I don't want you to hear me talk. Go away, go away. And we're coming here. Yeah, but now it's making me, it's got like a thing, there we go. It's not letting me do what I want to do, but I got it. So this is just going to kind of show you some, um, some close-ups to kind of show you what the details look like. And you're going to see me doing a lot of stuff. Uh, but I wanted to, what I wanted to show you was, uh, you know, come up here. So see, so you could walk around. And the, and the other side is very bare. I, I want it to be very clear. This is not substantial. <laughs> this is surface. And so then you could, you know, and, and, and it had this flexibility and anybody could come in and um, 
I would like to think empower themselves and, 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 and see how the trick is done. I wanna, so many times I wanna be the magician and, and the, the, the one who reveals the magician's secrets because I, I, I think like, I've always been one of those people that is like, this is so great, you should do, <laughs> you know, and then I wanna evangelize. I, I come from the land of Baptist, so I guess I find my own ways to evangelize. But, um, and I kinda wanted to show how like this particular project has been growing over 10 years. So it first started here. This is from grad school in 2012. Then I did it again in around 2015, 16. And then I did it again. <laughs> and I never felt like I got it right all these three times. That fourth time, I really feel like I got it. And then it, it gets a little bit bigger, a little bit more involved, a little bit every time. Um, and I really liked it about having a piece that just keeps growing and moving. Um, kind of going on to my body more specifically and how it, how it plays a role in, like I said, um, I think a lot of my journey with my own relationship to the world and how I fit in and, and my own uh, self-confidence and self-love um, was finding a way to see my body as attractive because I doubt it's changed that much, but when I was cutting my teeth in the gay community, the, the byline was, no fats, no fems, no Asians. Uh, it's just like, I don't know. So even in minorities, there are, there are questions and there are problems and there are struggles. Um, but but it, the thing about being queer is like, there's coming out and there, there's like, you, basically you have a second adolescence. Like, you, you, I am gay, I know I'm gay, I let the public know I'm gay, and then somehow it's kind of communicated that that's the end of it, and now you're a fully born queer and spread your wings and fly. But for me, it took many years to figure out where my body and my personality, I did not want to dance at a circuit club and drink uh, vodka tonics. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it, just, it, it didn't fit me. <laughs> and so I think part of that process was making these pieces um, where I would base my body off idealized body types from the ancient periods that have, because these, these, these perfection body types have been around for a long, 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 long time. Um, and I adopted this thing where I would hand sew with these gems, all, they're all real beads, pearls, and, and semi-precious stones, and glass, and all these things, um, treating my body almost as if it was um, a reliquary like what you do for a saint's body, where you, you, you cover this, this little bit that means so much to your church with gold and, and things. And I thought, what if I gave my, my own body that treatment? And, I, and it did two things. It forced me to sit and spend time with my body. These things take two to three months to make. Um, and I really do think that that helped me kind of find some love for my body. And the other thing it did was when I was out of grad school and had no money and wasn't well known enough for people to pay my own shipping, I, it was really hard to get these ceramics out. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could roll something up and put it in a box? And so that's kind of, I, so I, I also wanted to make something out of textile. But the other thing I really liked about textile is it's so tied to sensation of, of its, you, you think, when you think about a textile, you think so much about how that will feel against your skin because you're always wearing clothes. Um, this I made around 2000, uh, 18, uh, so we were fully into the Trump presidency and I was f starting a new job that was really stressful and I was just feeling very despair and so I adopted this pose from a Michelangelo, um, Soul of the Dam from the, the Last Judgment um, and had this great thing. So, so and they've, they've kind of been, I, I'm, I, I haven't had the time to make them, which is really sad because they've kind of turned into, and I hope they continue to be this, this document in my body. I gain weight, I lose weight, I change, I, I get a partner. All these things change, and, and these kind of things help me mark that. Um, and also, I think it's important to put, I don't think there's enough obese bodies in art history, not by a long shot. And so I'm trying to do my part by getting that, that visibility out there. Um, we're gonna move on to flowers and to my metalwork and out of ceramics. There's a, there's a lot of sculpture going on. This is a piece from grad school as well. This is my thesis show. Uh, down here on the end, you see these two little things. Those were dildos that operated at two different vibrancies. And so I strapped them on this piece and it made the thing shake and make this weird sound. Like it was like a humming beehive. And so I thought that was really interesting to do like a still life where it was both being attractive, a solid gold, 
floral arrangement, but it's making some weird noise. And, and so you're hopefully having kind of conflicting, should I approach it, should I not, should I trust it, should I not. Uh, and that's really continued on. And it kind of evolved into thinking about, um, as I'm making this work, drag is having its own kind of bloom and evolution. Um, and it's really getting me thinking a lot about when you when you look into the beginnings of decoration and you say, Where, what if we try to find decoration in nature? In nature, there are two types of decoration. You are either trying to camouflage or you are trying to project that you are poisonous and not to be messed with. And so there's this constant projection, hiding kind of thing going on in nature. And I think I see that a lot happening in queer culture. So if you've ever, has anybody ever seen the movie Paris is Burning? Um, I, if you haven't seen it, see it. It's required watching. Um, and what you'll see in that movie is it focuses on low-income people of color, queer people in New York City and the surrounding areas. And they're having balls, which we're all familiar with, but it's not really dragon that we'd see it. It's them trying to look like specific white people that they want to assimilate themselves to because they want to be treated in society like those people are treated. So you'll see them be, the category is, that's where this comes from, they would do the military category where you had to dress butch and be military. You, there was like the rich Law Street, you know, Wall Street executive and everybody wears suits and they, they couldn't afford these things. They were stealing them out of the stores. They were making them, they were doing whatever they could, but they were in that essence trying to push for camouflage. And I think now we've kind of switched uh, because now we have cell phones and social media to where I think we're going more about projection. Uh, and in the early days of RuPaul, I, this is like so clear to me. I don't know if they do it anymore. I kind of stopped watching around season six or seven. Um, but every, RuPaul would go to every contestant and basically be like, who hurt you? What, where, where did your trauma come from that you've, you've gone to the drag? And they would, they had all varying stories of family didn't accept them because they were too femme. They weren't masculine enough and, and the parent, you know, couldn't beat it out of, you know, would beat them, would abuse them. Or they just had self-loathing on themselves because they didn't match these things. And through drag, they were able to create these characters that had the confidence and the charisma that they wanted to have in their actual life and didn't have. And it seemed like really the whole function of this was like, maybe through this character, through this fantasy, um, we could, basically what it comes down to, uh, and people um, whose names are right in my head, but there's been a lot of gay theories are talking about, um, before you can get to utopia, you have to know what it looks like. And so I think a lot of drag is about inventing what the gay utopia is and, and just getting the image that we can kind of work towards. Um, and so I was just thinking about how I could work with that and tie that whole method into my love of art history and things like that. Um, so this mask was called the Project, uh, Project and Protect mask, or it was a mask for a weird queer. And I was kind of, you couldn't actually see through it. You could see through it a little bit, but I thought it was kind of being like, if you were a queer person who was feeling beat down by the world and needed a little help in holding up their, their, their mask of strength, you could put this on and, and have a little relief and also kind of shield yourself from the outside information coming in. Uh, this was me more. <laughs> Uh, I made this alright when I got out of grad school, and basically it was a, I was really interested in this character called Salinas because he's one of the only fat people I've ever seen in art history. Not surprisingly, he's a Rubens uh, character that comes out a lot. Um, anyways, it's a long story, but that was every drug that I'd taken at the time. So there was poppies, marijuana plant, a cocaine plant, and uh, mushrooms down here. Uh, and oh yeah, there's a tobacco plant too, because that's a drug too, I swear. And uh, anyways, I just was kind of thinking about escapes and getting to other worlds and etherealness. And um, it's actually interesting, the Greeks believe that, uh, I was very interested in this idea, like the Greeks see uh, existence and people living as this balance between order and chaos, which was Apollo and Dionysus. And if you got too much order, you became uh, basically a fascist and, and there was no room to move around. You kind of self-destructed under the pressure of it all. And if you were too, uh, if you were too wild, then you weren't actually a human, you were an animal. Um, and while the structure part of us seems the part that we should be going to, the Greeks recognized that if you didn't take time, they would have, they would have festivals where the goal was for them to get so drunk, literally, 
that the word ecstasy comes from the Greek word of astasis, which means that you could get so out of your head that you could step outside your being and get for a second a perspective of yourself and decide from there, did you like what you see or not? And if you didn't have those moments of craziness where you could step out and see it, the potential of you losing your way and getting lost in just blindless order um, would eventually kind of be too much of a good thing. Um, so I got really interested in that. This is another death mask. Uh, I call it, uh, I, it's made out of these shells that are fossil fly shells and they're, they're I think, uh, 80 million years old. No, they're 280 million years old. They're from before the dinosaurs. Um, and my, my dad bought this farm outside of uh, Waco, Texas, and uh, it had all these fossils on the ground. And I would flip my mind because I was like, there's just free fossils? Oh, my God. And everybody was like, oh, my God, Tony, yes, there's free fossils. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, they're on the ground. So I would collect them, and I had them for years, and I was trying to get to the bottom of why I was so fascinated by them, and I, and I think it got back into that idea of, of not understanding eternity and um, thinking about different methods of time. So uh, again, I was thinking about projection and building shields, and what am I protecting myself from? And most dust masks are kind of there to keep your identity intact as your flesh melts, the mask will keep your image alive and that's not what I thought this was doing for me this was functioning as a way of like if 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 I'm feeling stressed if I'm having you know anxiety about I'm gonna die or intrusive thoughts about all those kind of things um, if I held one of these shells in my hand and, and understood that in the in the existence of this shell 250 million years the whole history of humanity that 15,000 years is nothing Nothing, and my presence within that 15,000 years is nothing. So it became a fear of death mask. So if you were panicked, if you were having those things, you could put this mask on your head, lay down, and think about how small you are. <laughs> and it helped me feel better. Uh, so I wanted to show the jewelry. The jewelry is, um, oh, I love it so much. It's really fun to make. <laughs> Uh, the ceramics are what I make the money off of in the practice and the jewelry is what keeps the fire going because the ceramics, it's like I figured it out. If I trust my process and move forward with it, it's going to be okay. The jewelry is a fight till the end. And I, it, it, I'm, I, he'll see me go to the studio at noon and come back at midnight and be like, I didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> and have to go back to the studio again. But um, again, this, the, in ceramics, they always say, oh, well, the thing we really got going for us is that we're really, we're really an intimate arc. I mean, what are you, you know, we're your coffee cup, we're your toilet seat, we're your sink, we're, we're, we're in the everyday life. And I was like, what you're saying is true, but to me, if you really wanted to, to, you, to, to be in a place where that makes the most sense, it makes the most sense to me in jewelry. Uh, because uh, both it has that thing where it's like, a diamond can sell for $200 million. How does that make sense? Somehow it does. But again, it gets to that whole thing that I love about Antiques Roadshow, about directly into desire, but also the things that people love about jewels is the timelessness of them. There is Egyptian jewelry from 5,000 years ago that I couldn't dream of making today. And somehow 500 million years, or 500, or 5,000 years ago, they had um, the most amazing technology and they were putting it towards jewelry. And people have been, and they, basically they think as long as there's been farmer gatherers, even, even before people were settling and they were just trading, you know, gatherers, they were, they were um, trading amber and trading shells and making jewelry. Um, and I think again, it's because we wanna, we wanna tell people who we are and we want things that we can pass down to other people that we can invest in. And we, we want to, I want to feel, I started making jewelry. The reason is because I wanted to feel rich and beautiful and have amazing jewelry. And I, the only way I could do it was to make it myself. Um, and so there's, there's two sides of the jewelry. There's this orchid kind of theme. And this is very much directly related to queerness. Um, I have been using the image of the orchid for a long, long time because I think for me it's this perfect kind of symbol of what it is to be queer. Uh, my understanding, you know, the way I see orchids is they seem exotic, they seem rare, they seem from somewhere else, they seem 
um, extremely beautiful, but extremely um, from another world. And the truth about orchids is, is that actually they're the biggest plant, they're the biggest family uh, of any living thing. There are more orchid species than all the animal species combined, um, and then some. And they grow on every continent. There are orchids that have no leaves. There are orchids that <laughs> grow without dirt. There are orchids, uh, you know, that that are that live only because a fungi helps support them. Uh, just in Arkansas alone, where I live, there's 14 different varieties of orchids. There's probably over 10 in your state. Um, and so I thought, again, they were like this perfect thing that they seem to be one thing, but the more you look into them, the more you learn about them, they're exactly the opposite. Um, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting about them is they've long been associated with sex. So the word orchid comes from the Greek word for testicle. Uh, in the Victorian times, they were thought to be too titillating for women to be in the room with. And uh, Victorian gentlemen were so obsessed with collecting them that they would, they would be killed or kill each other uh, for the orchids. And why they were looking for these sexual flowers so much, I'll let you fill in. Um, so anyways, I, I, so I, I really have liked them to be these kind of queer power amulets for me. Uh, and then there's this other thing which is more kind of like the ceramic pieces where um, they're like a wonderkin cabinet where all these different elements are coming together. Um, and just working together to kind of give off luxury. I don't know. Okay. Uh, and so now we're coming to the end of it. Uh, we're kind of getting into more of my performance work, which is really the dark horse of the practice. I don't know what it means. Um, I don't know always if I like it, but I know it's important and it keeps everything fresh and kind of like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, what's happening here? And it's a place where I get into it. I don't have a lot of answers. What should I be doing? What are, you know, but, but they're, they're really trusting your gut and going into the crevasse. Um, and I think they've kind of been a way of me like really trying to, like I said earlier in the practice, one of the oldest kind of connections there is, is that flowers are a great symbol for the shortness of life and, and for the human body and for all these things. And, I, and again, I think flowers are so known to be beautiful that I had this urge to be flowers and I wondered what that looked like. And so I made this piece where I built basically armor out of ceramic that was perforated with all these holes and then became a living arrangement and went and collected all these flowers from the wild and just gardens. I was working on a, a, a residency on a college campus in California, so they just had flowers everywhere. And I made this piece, and it's one of my favorite things I've ever known. And then when I made this piece, I started thinking about, what does that remind me of? And it started reminding me of, has anybody ever seen these things? So these are called ghillie suits. And to me, they're kind of like a pinnacle of like aggressive masculinity. Because uh, like they're supposed to be super soldier snipers, and they're like, They'll, you will never see them coming and they'll shoot you in the head and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was like, oh my God, but they're also kind of beautiful. And these straight men are stumbling into this like living arrangement thing, the same thing as I am. And so I just thought about like, I, I, I want to take that imagery further and queer it further. Um, and it also aligned with, I had found a World War II helmet and I was like, I really want to use this object um, and, 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 and queer it and make it new and make it my own. And so I made this piece. Um, which is called uh, Weird Queer Ghillie Suit. Um, and uh, again, it, it's, just, it's just going down the same lines of, 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 of camouflage and projection and building off of that. And what, what do I, what do I want to be camouflaged in? Where do I want to belong? Where do I want to dream about? And for me, I just always kind of think about this gold heaven space where like queer, you know, <laughs> queer, queer, queer extravagance can just be. Um, and so uh, this piece, this is what, when the, when the pandemic fell down, I was like, oh, I've got time now, what am I gonna make? And I made this. Uh, and here's the suit on its own. It's, it almost works better just as a sculptural object. Um, and then the very last thing in the project, that's, that's something I would love to do more of, but it takes to get the situation to be right of like space and materials and, and everything coming together. These things only happen about every five years, but, um, the thing about ceramics is that you're so controlled by whatever size of the kiln you have, 
Like you can't fire something <laughs> if it's bigger than your kiln, it has to fit in the kiln. And so um, for several years, I've been complaining around with the idea of like, what if I was making things that were made the same way as my other, as my other structures? I need to mention one little bit about how I made those ceramics. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we're almost at the end. Anyway, so uh, basically it's, it's what I do is in the regular structures, I get figurines uh, from all over the place. I just bought 20 figurines today at your local St. Paul, uh, and I build them into a figure. They get covered uh, into a raw clay skeleton, and then I take fabric and fringe and all these things and dip them in slip and flowers and, and slip flowers and dip them in slip and cover them on top of us, this clay structure, build up the coats with slip, fire it, then everything that's not ceramic burns away. And the figurines that are already fired stay, they just stay there and they just get refired. Um, and I always like it because they feel like they, they're literal Frankensteins. They're these body parts coming together to make this new kind of super creature. Um, and so I realized that like I could carry that formula into non-fired works. And instead of a clay base underneath this is a, is a, a wood framework. And this was funny, like we, this is even on wheels. So I had to make it in one place and then wheel it down a hallway into the gallery. Um, but this was great because I got to work with students and they made the found objects for me. So I said, make me skulls and, and, and angels and flowers and wings. And so they made me a bunch of these things and I worked them in there. And it's really great because they, they have this huge kind of presence. And also it, it does the same thing in the ceramics. Is it, is it, it's not fire, but when the ceramic dries, it makes it stiff and then you can build off it and it unifies the surface. So it makes it all kind of blend together and feel like it's, as if it's one thing. Uh, and then just very lastly, that work has kind of translated into performances. Um, I really started thinking that this is a 17th century, so this, this is by Hyacinth Rigaud. He's the guy that painted the very famous Louis XIV picture where he's wearing high heels and has hosiery and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and this is a lesser known um, noble, but uh, basically the only thing that's real about this image that's based on an actual living thing is, is, is about 8% of the image, this face and these hands. And when the artist would have painted the portrait, he would have painted the face and hands with the person there in person. And then the other person could leave, the sitter could leave, and he would just make up this entire fantasy around it. And basically, it's just kind of saying that like this fabric is, is the pictorial equivalent of the wealth of the nation. And this leader is, 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 is literally draped in the wealth of the nation and, and he's a powerful ruler he's going to rule for a long time how do we know that because we see roman columns in the background and we know he has gold here that takes time that takes money silk is really hard to make velvet's really hard to make um and i just thought this feels like digital culture this feels like a TikTok filter in essence um and I, and I love the freedom of it. Like, I think one of the most important things that queer, queerness, I think, is heavily entwined with artificiality because so much, and I think this is true for a lot of uh, marginalized peoples for a lot of different ways, because if reality is not giving you what you need, then sometimes the only way forward is fantasy. And that's why club culture and drag and all the and decoration and all these things are so important to queer culture because um yeah we we have to live in fantasy more often than not uh so this is a performance piece where i was trying to like use my ceramic piece to kind of become one of those highest and through go portraits and so again i'm trying to be the magician and the and the debunker of the magician show i, I show you in the beginning me getting ready to get in Letting the belly hang out, I'm not, <laughs> anyway, so I'm getting in there and then I get in this contraption and then we start playing um, You Make Me Feel Mighty Real by Sylvester, uh, who was another very early trans icon. He was um, dressing as a trans person and playing around the gender in his clothing and doing it on an, on an international stage that I don't think anybody had done before him. And I think he's really, I think, I mean, his music is so good. It's like, it's kind of undeniable, but even the more you know about it, the more I understood about his kind of pioneering, like acceptance of his stealth and making a, and making a realm for that. Um, it's really inspiring to me. And so, 
Um, again, I kind of, I knew I had the image in my head, but I didn't know what to do. And the person that I was working with was like, you know what, I don't think we just get to see people be still and exist. So just try that. So really what the video ended me being was kind of showing me trying to step up into a higher plane of myself and basically vibe <laughs> in that place until the song was over. Um, anyways. And then the vid and then I kind of, you can see me getting tired because everything's very heavy. <laughs> and then uh, I'm waiting for a point where I, the end is over, I just throw this flower down. Done. And that's the end. So, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, guys. I tried to move as fast as I could. I know we're, you know we're past time. Um, before we move, uh, uh, we'll, we'll take a little time uh, for questions. But I forgot to mention right after the uh, talk. Uh, is an opening for the exhibition in the Marsh Gallery. Um, it's just down the hallway, those of you that don't know, uh, right uh, at the end. Uh, some of Anthony's work is included, and we have, uh, it's an it's a exhibition of uh, LGBTQ uh, Heron alum. And uh, we have a performance right at the beginning of the opening uh, by Boy uh, Barella. Uh, so, right at the beginning, that's going to happen. Also, tomorrow, uh, there's a panel discussion with, that is going to be moderated by Anthony. It's 11 to 12, and it's in the room 269. Uh, so, I hope you can uh, attend. Um, we have a little time for questions. Any of you? Uh, it's like an onslaught, I feel like. <laughs> it's the Here we go. Uh, thank you guys for staying and paying attention. I really apologize for going over time. I try not to do that. Um, I have a question. Um, the figurines, do you worry about, like, do you just kind of keep everything low to them? Or, like, do they ever melt? Or... Um, so I have to only use porcelain figurines, uh, and so a lot of, uh, basically I've, I've, I, after buying literally thousands and thousands of figurines, I can pick up a figurine and just tell by the temperature and the weight of it if it's porcelain or not. Um, and porcelain can be fired to extremely high temperatures, so um, I can fire these works. They have to be fired to mid-range temperature, which would be cone 5 or 6, to be strong enough to just be handled around. And I fire them all the way up to like cone 10 or 11, and they're, they're fine. But uh, there were times where things melt or they fool me, and yeah, sometimes they melt. <laughs> I guess the relationship would be is I, I view beauty as maybe on the other spectrum as terror. Uh, I don't like terror. I don't watch scary movies. I don't like that emotion. Um, so uh, I guess I would say that uh, beauty for me is a way of dealing with terror. Actually, this is this is how the Greeks viewed it. They 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 they, they how they view tragedy. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it, but basically it's just like. Um, the Greeks recognized that existence was suffering, which is a very kind of Buddhist idea, and so they believed that 
beauty as in their plays and their art was basically the sugar that made the medicine go down that if you didn't have those uh, kind of help alongs to smooth the harshness of reality which could very easily equal terror then there was really no way to go forward and so I guess the relationship would be is like beauty is the way to move through the terror of reality <laughs> that makes sense to me I know you discussed both um, extravagance and like the queer experience in your work. Is there um, like a specific connection between extravagance and opulence and being queer that you thought about or uh, studied during the creation of your works? Um, I, I haven't gotten to the bottom of it. It's a question that I'm asking and I'm actively asking, and it's very. Um, I think a lot of, of where I've put myself in making work within the queer experience is is to is to move around the sexual question of it all because I think sometimes that could that's too much for me at least of feeling like I'm playing into uh, what conservative and religious conservatives want us to be talking about and I think that the other aspects of queer culture are much more harder to pin down and so there hasn't been enough research in these connections and it's going out there. Um, and I, I, I think when you, especially say if you're a queer person living in the 80s and you think you're going to die and nobody's going to save you, Reagan doesn't care, that is this birth of the, of the club scene. And I think because maybe sometimes if you're a marginalized person, you feel like you have uh, not a lot to lose. And so luxury and living in the moment and, and feeling alive and feeling your body and feeling your pride and feeling powerful um, is very important. And I think oftentimes in the queer community that's expressed through aesthetics of luxury and decadence. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm on the social media. You can ask me questions on Instagram. <laughs> Sorry, this is the okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, it's not your survey, so we can get more money in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful program, really good. Any more questions? Okay. Again, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it.